Kaushik, I'm here. Hey, hi, Mahesh. Hi, Mahesh. We can see you. Uh, yep. The audience is also in. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. The presentation will start in another two minutes. Today, Srinivas and Murali and Kunal Dasgupta from IIM Bangalore will be presenting Pandemic Containment and Inequality in a Developing Economy. We have Professor Shankar Chakraborty from the University of Oregon Economics Department who will be discussing their paper. For those of you who are coming for the first time, the rules are fairly simple and straightforward. Audience members can ask questions whenever they wish in the Q&A box. The authors will do their best to try and answer those questions on the fly. If one of the other authors can answer them as one of the authors is presenting, that will happen. If not, the authors will try and answer these questions once the discussion is completed. Uh, Srinivasan has one hour to complete his presentation, after which Shankar has half an hour to do his discussion. Any time that's left over will go to answering audience questions uh, from Srinivasan and Kunal. We are expecting Kunal to also join us. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, as users of CPHS will probably know and are waiting with bated breath, tomorrow is the last day of wave 22. We will complete the data collection tomorrow and will hopefully then make the data available to subscribers as soon as possible. In the past, that's always happened with between one and two days of data collection being complete. We hope to be able to do the same this wave as well. We are also hiring. I had made an announcement about this last time, and uh, that continues to be the case. If any of you are interested, please look at our pinned tweet for more details. We are CPHS on Twitter, underscore CPHS on Twitter. Now I will quickly introduce our panelists. We have Srinivasan Murli and Kunal Dasgupta from IIM Bangalore. We have Shankar Chakraborty from the University of Oregon, the Department of Economics. We have Mahesh Vyas. Mahesh is the MD and CEO of CMI. Mahesh is also the Chief Architect of the Consumer Pyramids Household Survey. And as always, you have me, Kaushik Krishnan. I also work at CMI. Srinivasan, it's exactly 7.35 PM India time. So over to you. Thank you so much for presenting at the CPHS Research Seminar. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kaushik and Mahesh for inviting me. And thank you so much, Shankar, for uh, discussing the paper. And uh, thank you so much for everyone who has who are here. So today I'm going to talk about the pandemic containment and inequality in a developing economy. Uh, so even though I'm quite happy to be presenting in this forum, but I'm quite sad that this paper is still relevant even in today, right? At least in the Indian context. So this is something we wrote during the first lockdown and uh, the first uh, wave of the COVID. And this is the paper, the paper deals with the first wave basically uh, from April all the way till September. Uh, but that is what you should keep in mind. So we are not going to talk anything about the current wave or uh, the current uh, scenario what is happening in India. So what do we have here? So the goal of the paper is uh, to study the economic and the disease dynamics together. So we are going to study the macroeconomic fluctuations or the impact of the pandemic on the macroeconomic side, which I'm going to talk in terms of either GDP, which is the output income, or in terms of inequality, which is the primary focus of the paper. And also we are going to talk about the disease dynamics in terms of how the infections are moving. And we are going to study together in an integrated framework. And the model is going to be calibrated for India. Right? So, so we the paper has two components here. One is the data side, which is the empirics part, which is coming from the consumer pyramid household survey. Why do we need the consumer pyramid household survey? We are going to get the data on income or uh, the income in this case, specifically the labor income, which is what our model is targeted on, and the inequality. All right, so those two data are going to come from the consumer pyramid household survey. Uh, so what I mean by inequality here, which I'm going to explain a bit more, is basically we are going to talk about how the high-skilled workers and the low-skilled workers have fared through the pandemic and the lockdown. And I'm going to analyze the relative wage or the relative income between high-skilled and low-skilled as my measure of inequality. And uh, so those data I'm going to get from the CPHS and data on disease dynamics we get from the crowdsourced uh, resource that everyone might be well aware of, which is the COVID-19India.org. Right? And so these are the empirics I'm going to use to discipline and my model and explain what is happening. All right? These are the targets for our study. And from the model side, I'm going to integrate an SIR model, which I'm going to talk a bit more about, which is basically susceptible infect infected and recovered model, which is a benchmark epidemiological model we integrate it in a simple macroeconomic framework, right? So 
again the target or the focus of this our study is in terms of inequality between high skilled and low skilled workers so our model is also going to feature the high skilled and low skilled workers and the high skilled and low skilled workers can supply two different kinds of labor basically the on site and remote i'm going to explain a bit more on that right but the purpose of the model or the purpose of our study is i'm going to uh, experiment with two different government policies right one is the lockdowns that are being implemented and the other one is the transfers right so what is the impact of lockdowns and the transfers on both the economic front and the disease front right and can we explain a bit of what has happened in reality right that's the goal of the study and so what we find and from the empiric side uh, the cphs the data shows that uh, unsurprisingly there is a drastic decline in the aggregate income again it's the labor income the average income has fallen by around 35% in the time of the lockdown which is april to june compared to the uh, previous like compared to uh, pre lockdown income right and also the inequality has increased sharply right the inequality between high skilled and low skilled income and once we write a model we do find that these are the findings from the model that there is a trade off between containment of infections and economic activity right so suppose if the government implements us a harsh lockdown yes it is going to benefit on the health side it is going to reduce the infections but it is also going to inflict a lot of cost on the economic front right and there are enough evidence for this to have uh, for this uh, as you can see from the newspapers where if india implemented a very stringent lockdown we did see a huge crash in the gdp which is what our model also predicts but more importantly the focus of the paper that i will i'm going to show you and hopefully convince you that the containment policies which is the lockdown here they increase income inequality between high skilled and low skilled workers and more importantly uh, they are also less effective among low skilled workers right so why is that so here how we define high skilled and low skilled workers is basically based on education we think that at least uh, consistent with the literature people who have some college education we are going to consider them as high skill and people who do not have college education we consider them as low skills and the nature of occupation of the high skilled workers is such that they can afford to work from home they have the flexibility to work from home but on the other hand the low skilled workers do not have that flexibility right for example you can think of high skilled workers as an accountant or an economist we can work from home but on the other hand a machine operator they cannot work from home right they have to be at the place of work in order to make their living right so this disparity in their nature of occupations is going to inflict an inequality in their health outcome as well, as i'm going to show you in the presentation and finally that is the lockdown part of the story now i'm going to introduce transfers and we are going to solve for transfers to see in this model framework what is what is the uh, how does transfers affect our dynamics in both economic and health front i'm going to show you that once if you are going to introduce transfers along with the lockdowns the transfers actually helps in reducing this inequality on the health front right so even though the transfers are designed to reduce income inequality they can reduce health inequality as well so one of the punch line of the paper is in the times of a pandemic the transfers can and does behave as both an economic and also as a health policy right so if the lockdown has to be implemented then we argue that it has to be implemented along with transfers right? to uh cushion the blow so that is the broad overview of the paper and what we have done so so now going into the details first on the empiric side so the data of course i'm presenting in the cphs seminar so i'm using the cphs data and you guys are well aware of cphs is one of the uh foremost authority on the panel data in india so if you want to study any short run fluctuations from the macroeconomic point of view then i believe cphs is the only data source with respect to india right so the cphs is a high frequency panel it covers around 170k households and what we consider is the data from september 2019 to 20 june 2020 all right so september 2019 to jan feb is basically our benchmark and from march april is our time of the pandemic and lockdown till the june all right so we assume that or basically the first lockdown lasted from april to june and that is where our focus of the study is and i'm going to consider only the individuals who are aged between 20 and 60 years and once we impose uh, some of the sample restrictions we have monthly income or wage data which is the labor income data for around 440000 individuals right? and as i said the skill definition we are interested in the inequality between high skilled and low skilled workers i'm going to assume that the low skilled workers are someone who has 
completed school with no college, while high skilled workers are someone who has some college education. Right? Either they are in college, in they are dropped out of college or finished college or post grad. Everything is considered as high school. And the object of interest is going to income and from the economic point of view, which is the wages from the labor market, and also the inequality, which is the relative income of high skilled to low skilled workers. Right? So we are going to see how these two objects has uh, basically evolved during the time of the pandemic and the lockdown, the first lockdown. Right? Now, one of the one straightforward way to do that is, of course, I can always look at the just the average income. Just take the entire sample, average the income, and then average high skilled and low skilled income and divide it. That is one way to do it. But one of the concerns here uh, with the ongoing lockdown is there has been some kind of sample attrition that has happened with CPHS, and also there are um, people drop out. So and there could be changes in the composition. So the literature suggests that, even though not this literature directly, but the literature on wage cyclicality and some of the other literature suggests that there is a way to get over this composition bias, right? So how do we do that? Basically, you exploit the panel structure of your data to construct the aggregate data, right? So what I do is quite straightforward. So just take YIT. YIT is basically the labor income of individual I at time T, right? And I regress that with an individual fixed effect and the time fixed effect. Right and the error term. Right now, what this t, which is the time fixed effect, gives us, it is basically your aggregate measure after controlling for your sample, any changes in the sample. Right, because this regression is just going to capture any variation within an individual, and then we are going to aggregate that variation over time. Right, so that way we at least our imperfect may be, but we are able to control some measure of uh, sample attrition or any imbalance in the sample. But I'm pretty sure Kaushik and uh, Mahesh assured us that there has been no uh, major imbalance in the sample. They tried to maintain the discipline of the sample, but still we took this extra caution just to be sure. Right? Now, similarly, we ran similar regressions for high-skilled and low-skilled workers to construct the aggregate high-skilled and low-skilled income. Right? So what do we find once we do that? So this is kind of the picture you should uh, that comes out of our empirical analysis. Right? The left panel is basically your aggregate income. So as you can see, like this is basically the deviation from the steady state. What we consider as steady state is your average income from September to Feb, right? September 2019 to Feb 2020 is what we consider as steady state. So this is the deviation that happened. So as you can see from March, it even before it was slightly declining, but basically the once the lockdown was imposed, your aggregate income crashed, right? In the April, the aggregate income was just 50%, which is 0.5, right? 50% of what it was in the previous year. And once after a point in May and June, it kind of came back up, but still nowhere close to where it was pre right? And more, more importantly, the focus of the paper is on inequality, which is the relative income between high skilled and low skilled. And you can see that there is a sudden jump starting from March or April, right? So at the steady state, the inequality was around 2.6. That means the, an average high skilled worker earned around two and a half times more than a low skilled worker. But this inequality jumped to around 4.6, almost doubled, right? So this is the exact measure is around aggregate income fell by around negative 35% and the inequality jumped by around 35%, right? So it's, and it kind of gives us a bit more confidence because I'm not sure whether uh, some of you might have attended uh, the previous CPHS seminar by Anup Malani and Arpit Gupta, and they showed a very similar uh, kind of plot for aggregate income. Right? I don't think they disciplined or they did any of these econometric exercises, but even using the sample straight away, it gives a very similar plot like this. So that kind of gives more credence to what we are showing. All right, so that is the economic side, right? So the goal of our paper is to explain what is happening on the income and also the inequality, right? But what happened on the health side? Again, to, again the data is coming from COVID-19.org, COVID-19India.org, and we are stopping the data in mid-December, all right? So we are not, talking about the second wave that is going through right now. And this is kind of what it looks like considering um, day Jan 1st to be the day zero or day one, we do believe that the infections peaked around day 261, all right? And the days to double, that is how many days it took on average the infections to double till it reached the peak. We start, we measure it from the day the lockdown was imposed till the infections peak, that is around 21 days, right? Every 21 days they, on average, the infections was doubling. Right? But it's still a nonlinear function, so it's not always constant. All right. 
So these are the two objects that we are going to write a model to explain and study a bit deeper, right? What is driving these changes or what is driving these phenomena in the data? All right. So just going into the bit of a model. So to start with, there is no pandemic, right? So I'm just gonna introduce a very simple macroeconomic framework, right? So there is a household, right? And there is a unit measure of workers in that and where the psi fraction of them are high skilled and one minus psi fraction are low skilled. Right? And the psi and all these parameters we are going to calibrate later from CPHS and other data sources. So where from now on, if I'm gonna say H or L, that means it's either high skilled or low skilled. Okay? So what is the problem here? Both high skilled and low skilled workers, they are going to maximize their discounted lifetime utility, which I'm gonna call it as capital U, by choosing consumption, which is C, and there are two kinds of labor, as I mentioned, which is the on-site labor and remote labor, right? So the and worker can choose either to work, go to their on-site or go to their place of work and work there, or they can choose to work from home, right? So they have the flexibility to choose. Right? So those are the three choices that a worker can, uh, or any worker is going to take, which is consumption, on-site labor, which is N here, and remote labor, which is N hat, all right? So to maximize their lifetime utility, subject to the budget constraint. So what is the budget constraint here? Broadly speaking, the consumption should be equal to the total income, right? So that is the budget constraint that it says. We'll go into the details in a bit, but that is the broad budget constraint. Uh, one thing that immediately sticks out is there is no savings in this model, right? So there is just consumption should be equal to the total uh, income. It's just for the simplicity, of course, adding savings would be quite attractive. This. So now let's unpack what is the income here, right? So W is the wage that WJ is basically the wage that either a high skill or a low skill worker receives for the total amount of labor supply, right? Which is the object inside the bracket. Now, what is the total amount of labor supply here? So N is the total hours of on-site labor that is being supplied. And N hat is the total amount of remote labor that is being supplied, right? Now the eta is basically captures how substitutable that on-site labor and remote labor are. Right? So the eta should eta you should think of it as what is the loss in the productivity or what is the cost of substituting from on-site labor to remote labor. So eta is usually between zero and one, right? And we'll pin down the parameter for this. So this is usually it's always between zero and one. And eta captures the cost of working remotely, right? So because on-site and remote labor are not perfect substitutes, but our calibration is going to tell you that this eta is bigger for a high-skilled worker compared to a low-skilled worker. That is where our inequality, the model is going to generate our inequality, right? So a high-skilled worker, the on-site labor and remote labor are much more substitutable. So they can easily shift to working from home compared to going to office, but a low-skilled worker do not have that luxury, right? So that is the first point. And so that is the labor supply part. And what are these two objects? So mu is basically our measure of lockdown, right? It is the containment policy. That is how we model containment policy. What is this? This is basically a productivity cost on on-site labor, right? So suppose the government is going to impose lockdown, then it is going to make the on-site labor more and more costly, okay? So it could think of it as there is no public transport or there is, uh, or you just can't get out of home, whatever may be the co uh, cost, it's all modeled as a cost on on-site labor. Basically it restricts labor mobility, right? Physical mobility of labor. And so in a benchmark case, when there is no pandemic, this mu has to be zero, right? But when the pandemic starts, then this mu keeps on increasing, right? And what is this gamma? Gamma is the other government uh, policy that we are interested in, which is transfers, right? So the government can physically provide money to these uh, workers that can relax their budget cash, right? So, so that is the simple household level, household side problem, right? In which we are going to superimpose an SIR model, right? But this, framework is quite straightforward. It's just consumption should be equal to total income where income comes from purely labor, where there are two kinds of labor, which is on-site labor and remote labor. And there are two government policies that can influence this budget constraint. One is mu, which is the containment policy. And the other is gamma, which is the transfers. Okay. So that is the household side. Now, what happens on the firm side? Again, the firm side is very simple. There is gonna be a continuum of competitive firms. There is no frictions, nothing. So they need both high-skilled and low-skilled labor to produce their output, all right? And so 
the basically the production function here is a times l right so a is basically your total factor productivity and l is the total amount of labor right and how is it defined it's basically a cs aggregator between basically they take some amount of high skill labor some amount of low skill labor and they aggregate using a cs aggregator where delta captures the elasticity of substitution between those two kinds of labor right and as you can see that the firms do not care whether it is on site labor or remote labor as long as it's the total magnitude of high skill and total magnitude of low skill is what matters and gamma basically captures the difference in productivity or difference in income between high skill and low skill right so the gamma is calibrated to match the benchmark inequality that we find in the cphs data okay so that is your firm problem so a times l is the total amount of output and w times l basically is the amount of wage payment for high skill and low skill labor respectively and the firm is going to choose both high skill and low skill labor to maximize this profit Right. that is the firm problem and finally the equilibrium which is the goods market clearing and the, the market clearing which is the goods market all it says is the total amount of output should be equal to total amount of consumption so high skill consumption high, there are psi high skill people and they are going to each consume ch and 1 minus psi low skill people they are going to consume cl similarly the labor market again the total demand for high skill labor should be equal to the total supply of high skill labor similarly for the low skill right so these are the three components for a simple macroeconomic frame right there is a household problem firm problem and the equilibrium market clearing conditions okay so this is the a model we, on top of which we are going to superimpose an sir framework right so till now we haven't talked about pandemic at all and now suppose if a pandemic is going to hit this economy right this very simple economy so what is going to happen so basically how the epidemiologists model or or at least the economists lot of macro uh, economists model a uh, pandemic is through the sir frame right so what it says is once the pandemic is going to hit the economy immediately there are going to be four different varieties of population right the population is going to be subdivided into four different groups one is the susceptible group which is those who have not been infected yet but they are can there is a possibility that they will be infected in the future so they are susceptible to be infected that is the s group there is i group which is they are already infected right and r they have been infected but they have recovered and d they have been infected but they couldn't survive right so these are the four groups immediately when there is a pandemic raging through the economy then the population gets divided into these four groups okay and here we have two different types of workers that we have which is high skill and low skill so there are going to be eight different groups of population right there is going to be s i r and d within high skill and similarly for low skill now how do we model this evolution of infections right uh, the infection dynamics so t is basically the total amount of new infections at a given period right amount of new infections or the total amount of new infections that has happened in the new period in the given period so a person can get infected by three different channels right this is kind of coming from a seminal paper uh, by eikenbaum rebelo and terbant which start which is one of the early papers that's basically started of this macro sir literature so what it so a person can get infected by three different channels one is the consumption channel that is you go uh, you are a susceptible person you go to a consumption based activity maybe go out to buy some food or any of the consumption channel or go to a restaurant and you meet an infected person right so s times c is basically the total amount of susceptible consumption and i times c is the total amount of consumption done by the infected person right so s times c is basically the total amount of meetings that are happening between a susceptible people and an infected person in the consumption channel right and pi s1 is the probability with which these meetings gets converted into an active infection right so as you might see that all it matters is the total amount of consumption it doesn't matter as long if you are a high skill worker or low skill worker it doesn't matter whom you meet as long as the person is infected right it doesn't matter whether you meet an in high skilled infected person or a low skilled infected person right as long as you meet an infected person there is a chance that you are going to get infected right so that is why even though the susceptible people has a j superscript which tell it's either high skill or low skill all it matters is the total amount of infected consumption in the consumption channel right so that is the first part and similarly the second channel is through the labor market right you go out to work and you meet an infected person there at the place of work right 
Now, the important thing to note here is, again, the format is very similar, right? This is the total amount of labor of susceptible total amount of labor of the infected. But the important thing is, it is just the on-site labor, right? If you're working remotely at your home, we assume that there is no risk of getting contaminated or infected, right? So the total amount of on-site labor provided by the infected person is going to determine how many susceptible people are getting infected through the labor channel, right? Again, pi S2 is basically the probability with which the infect, the, these meetings can get converted into infections. And similarly, the third channel is through social interaction. It could be through any other means. It is just where randomly a susceptible person and an infected person comes together. Right? And then there is again a possibility that the pi S3 is the probability with which those meetings can get converted into actual infections. Right? So the total amount of infections in a given period can either come from the consumption channel, which is the first term, labor market channel, or just through social interaction. Right? So those are the three channels through which the total active infections can, new infections can come. Right? That is being denoted by TT. Okay. Now the infection rate, I'm going to call it as tau, is basically total amount new infections as a fraction of total susceptible population. Right? So how much of the total susceptible population got converted into infected? So that is the infection rate that is going in the economy. All right. So that is the major equation in this model. Now, taking that into account, so what is the law of motion in this model? So these are all the aggregate objects, how it is moving across the economy. So the susceptible population in tomorrow, which is ST plus one is whoever was susceptible today minus whoever got infected, right? So TT is the total amount of new infections that has happened in the given period. So ST plus one is ST, which is the amount of susceptible people today minus the active infections or the new infections. And what is the infected population tomorrow? Again whoever was infected today, plus new infections that have been added today, minus whoever either recovered or dead, right? So pi r is the probability of recovery, times i is the total amount of people that have got recovered, pi d is the probability of dead, and pi d times i is the total amount of uh, deaths in the economy, right? So the <clears throat> it plus one is whatever is the active infection today, plus new infections, minus whoever is out of the infection pool, either through recovery or through death. And similarly, the recovered population is how, for tomorrow is how much of a recovered today plus new recovery that has been added to the pool, okay? And similarly, dead. So whoever has been dead for tomorrow is whoever has been dead today plus, so these are all cumulative numbers, right? Plus the new deaths that has been added. And finally, the population, so of course, when the pandemic is raging, then the population is going to decline. So this is the population Tomorrow is population today minus whoever people who couldn't survive. Okay. So this is the overall law of law of motion in this economy. So now what is going to happen is all these susceptible, infected, and recovered people of both high-skilled and low-skilled workers, they are going to take these laws of motion as a given, and they are going to choose their individual consumption, on-site labor, and remote labor, just like before. Right? So the macroeconomic model is very similar in terms of choices, but they're going to take these laws of motion as a given, right? There is more constraints that is being added. All right, so before going there, so what is the initial condition? So of course, we are gonna assume that epsilon fraction of total population are infected in period zero, right? And we, I'll tell you what epsilon is uh, when we are discussing calibration. So we are gonna assume that epsilon fraction is infected. So we distribute between high skill and low skilled workers and one minus epsilon fraction are susceptible. They're not infected, right? So now, so basically, as I said, so this is how the susceptible people's uh, decision problem is going to look right now, right? The susceptible people infected and recovered, they're going to take these laws of motion as given, and they're going to choose their consumption, the on-site labor and remote labor every people, okay? Now, one, the immediately what you can see is in the simple macroeconomic framework, the choosing of consumption on-site and remote labor was a static problem, right? So whatever you choose today is not going to affect tomorrow, right? So it's basically a static problem and every period there is no shocks, there is no friction. So whatever you are choosing, it's going to remain constant over time. But now the moment you introduce a pandemic, this problem becomes a dynamic problem. Why is that? Your choice of consumption, remote and on-site labor today is going to affect the probability with which you will get infected tomorrow, right? So that is basically what this problem reflects. Right, so what it is, let's unpack it a bit, right? So this part is very similar. So 
this is the consumption on site labor and remote labor which is what determines their utility but what is happening tomorrow now with the probability tau which is the infection rate you are going to get infected which is u power i right u subscript superscript i so i is the infection and with probability 1 minus tau you will remain susceptible okay so you are working and with the and you are susceptible today so you don't have an infection but with the probability tau you are going to get infected tomorrow and with the probability 1 minus tau you are not going to get infected but the problem is your action today is going to affect your tau right so why is that so they are going to take the total amount of consumption and total amount of infected labor as given but still as you can see that ct and nt enters their definition of tau right so mechanically speaking the choice of your c and choice of your n is going to affect your tau which is the probability with which you are going to get infected tomorrow right so that is why it's a dynamic problem your choice today is going to affect your infection tomorrow right so that is how the susceptible worker is going to solve their optimization problem okay and similarly what about the infected worker again it's similar so they are going to again the infected worker is going to choose again same three things consumption on site labor and remote labor but now the what is happening tomorrow with the probability pi r they are going to get recovered which is what is represented as u r and with the probability pi d they are going to be they are not going to survive and we take that utility to be zero so it has dropped off and with the remaining probability they are going to remain infected okay so they still haven't come out of the infection now what is happening so the budget constraint is very similar except for this extra fee term right what does it represent it's basically we model with infection there is going to be a loss of productivity right and we model that fee is the extra loss of productivity in on site labor and fee hat is the extra loss of productivity in the remote labor right so basically you are too sick to work right so that is uh, what is modeled by fee and finally the recovered worker once you have recovered we assume that there is no uh, possibility of reinfection so you are back to the good old world of a static problem right so it's very similar to a macroeconomic framework i just showed you at the start when there is no parallel right they are going to choose consumption on site and remote labor and there is no dynamics and your choice is not going to affect anything in the future right. so this is how the susceptible infected and recovered people are going to solve their problem both for high skilled and low skilled workers right and finally what is the market clearing here it is just bit more uh, messy but it's very similar to what i showed you already already so the total amount of high skill labor now they are going to come from three groups which is the susceptible high skill infected high skill and recovered high skill right all three groups are going to supply their labor right similarly for low skill again it's coming from s i and r right and then the firm is going to combine lh and ll using a cs aggregator as i just showed you so that is how the labor market clears and similarly how what is the goods market clearing similar story right now the consumption of high skill is coming from three groups consumption of low skill is coming from three groups and finally the total consumption should be equal to total amount of output or total production right so that is how the market clearing works here all right and finally so what is the calibration right so what are the parameters that we are choosing so i kind of uh, explain different parameters so how to fix some of the parameters i'm not going to go into in depth uh, we can always discuss at the end of the talk or you can refer to my paper so the two important parameters that are going to govern majority of the dynamics in the model is eta h and eta l right just to remind you all eta h is the talks about the substitutability between high skill or uh, sorry substitutability between on site and remote labor right so eta h represents that for high skill and eta l represents that for low skill right so as you can see that eta h is much higher compared to eta l right so 0.32 so if you want to put, uh, intuitively if you want to understand how you can think of it as like suppose there are 100 people 100 high skilled workers then 32 of them can pretty much work from home right but in the case of low skilled only four of them can work from home right so that is one way of interpreting that. but 0.32 and 0.04 captures the cost of or substitutability between on site and remote and we take that value from saltiel 2020 and it's a paper it's not uh, focused on india but it focuses on majority of developing economies and they find that this number is fairly robust across countries so we take the average of the value but we do uh, robustness checks also right? and psi psi is the fraction of high skilled workers and based on our definition the fraction is around 20% we take from nss and delta is the elasticity of substitution between high skilled and low skilled workers which we take from asimoglu and otter 
but we do robustness checks with other values as well. And phi and phi hat is 0.8. Just remind you, phi and phi hat captures the productivity loss due to infections. What this 0.8 represents, one way to motivate this is around 80% of the people are asymptomatic. So that is what this number represents, but we can find other ways of motivating this number, but we take this value from Eichenbaum et al. And beta captures the discount factor and uh, it basically says that the model period is one day and the real interest rate is around 4%. So that's what you get here. And gamma captured the, in the it was in the CES production function. So gamma captures the, um, the productivity differential between high skill and low skilled labor. And that we choose to match the pre-pandemic steady state inequality that we got from the CPHS, right? So which is around 2.67. Similarly, A is the TFP, which again we choose to match the pre-pandemic average daily income. Again, which is around 182 rupees. Again, we got it from the CPHS. And finally, the theta and theta hat, it basically captures the disutility of labor for high on-site and remote. And this is just chosen to say that on average at the steady state, high skilled workers work around five hours outside and 1.5 hours at home, right? But these are all level effects. It's not, it should not affect whatever I'm gonna tell you. Right? So, <clears throat> all right, so that is basically your economic parameters. What happens to the disease parameters? Again, we have to, we have a bunch of probabilities that we need to calibrate. So pi r is the probability of recovery and pi d is the probability of death. So again, I'm not gonna go into the details, but um, what we assume is there are two things. One is on average, we assume that the incubation period is around 18 days for COVID. So once you're infected in 18 days, you are either recovered or you don't survive, right? So that is pretty much what the literature seems to think. And we calculate the mortality rate from the data, which is the COVID-19 org, and this is the mortality rate that we get. And assuming R not to be around 2.2, this is the numbers that we get, right? And finally, uh, we have the three channels of transmission for infections. So we get like pi S1 and pi S2 and pi S3, which is the probability of infection through consumption, labor, and the social interaction channel. How are we gonna get it? We use the time use survey of India, 2019 version, which is the latest. And we allocate the total probability of infections across these three channels based on how many hours a typical Indian spends on these three different channels, right? And finally, epsilon, epsilon is the fraction of individuals that got infected in day zero. And we take that to be 10 power minus six, which we assume that around 1300 individuals were infected at the start, right? At day zero, right? Uh, which is around 1.3 billion is Indian population. So 10 power minus six is around 1300. All right. So now let's go into the results, right? So this is the model sketch. And now we are gonna talk about in terms of two, uh, two things that we are in, very interested in. One is the economic impact, which is the economic side of the story. Other is the health impact, right? So economic impact, I'm gonna capture based on output loss, which is how much a recession or how much GDP has declined. But in this case, it's the labor income. And the other more important thing is income inequality between high skilled and low skilled workers, right? And the other side is the health impact. Of course, you are imposing a lockdown and you also need to think about whether it is benefiting on the health side. So we are gonna track it in these two ways. One is the peak infection rate that captures the stress on the hospitals and also the days to double, which is the speed at which the infection is doubling or infection is spreading through the economy. Right? So suppose this is the benchmark case. So suppose there is no policy, right? If you are just introduced, based on this calibration, you are modeling a COVID pandemic in this economy. And this is what you are going to see. <clears throat> this is what is, at least the model predicts, this is what should have happened. Right? when there is no policy. So let's start with the infections. So the high skilled and low skilled infections are pretty similar, pretty symmetric. And the infection should have peaked around 200 days, around 210, 220 days. And at the peak, around 15% of the population would be infected, right? These are active infections, right? Not accumulated. So around 15% of the population would be infected at the, so these are huge numbers. Right? And what is happening? So again, at, during the peak time, so your output has reduced by around 16%. Right, so remember, so there is no lockdown here yet, but even the just the pandemic can cause recessions in these models, right? Because the moment the pandemic starts, then the people are going to cut back on their labor supply because now it's going out is turning out to be increasingly risky. And so the cutting back or substituting to remote labor is going to induce a recession, right? Even without a lockdown, a recession can happen. But interestingly, they are going to substitute between onsite and remote labor in such a way, but that there is actually no change in inequality, right? I mean, it might think that you might think that there is a decline in inequality here, but if you see the numbers here, there is hardly any change, right? So the inequality barely changes 
when there is no policy right why do you think that so basically as you can see both on site and remote labor they are on site and remote workers they are substituting from on site labor to remote labor right sorry high skilled and low skilled workers are substituting work from on site and remote labor so both people they are going to reduce the on site uh, labor because again it is not because of government action it is purely because of fear of pandemic right they are going to get infected and they don't want to get infected. so their on site labor goes down for both high skill and low skilled workers and the remote labor jumps up right but they are going they are in a very similar magnitude in terms of percentage terms so the inequality doesn't change by much right so this is the benchmark case uh, which we are going to peg against uh, any of our government policies now suppose if we introduce containment policies what i mean by containment so uh, to remind it is the cost on on site labor right it is basically the cost on labor mobility so which is the parameter mu right so suppose again these are just uh, for examples uh, we still do not know exactly how to calibrate them but these are the numbers that uh, even eikenbaum uh, rebel trabant uses in their models so we kind of use a very similar numbers of similar magnitude right so we assume that around 80% right that is their containment rate and right? so the cost has so basically 1 minus mu is the measure of lockdown so 80% is basically whatever on site labor you were supplying only now it is worth 20% only right so the productivity cost has jumped quite uh, quite a lot for on site labor alone right? so what we assume is from the 100th day the government is imposing lockdown which is an 80% so the maximum it can be 100% so it's pretty much very severe lockdown so 20% is you can think of it as essential services that are being allowed to operate right so 80% lockdown and that is going to continue for 300 days right from 100 to 400 these are extreme scenarios right the other count that we are going to call a sustained containment the other policy that we are experimenting is the staggered containment which is now there is a step function for every 100 days the government is relaxing right starting with 80% severity then it goes down to 50 and then it goes down to 30 right these are just for example right now once you introduce what is happening so as you can see that the green line is no policy case which we just discussed and this black line is with containment once you impose lockdown the lockdown does affect the infections right so there is a drastic reduction in the infections right so the high skill or sorry the the peak infection rate for the high skill has gone down from around 15% to all the way to 8% right and similarly for low skill okay but one thing that you can immediately see is there is actually a disparity between high skill and low skill infection even though both of both high skill and low skill workers are suffering the lockdown the the lockdown is much more effective in controlling infections among high skill workers because the peak infection rate went down from 15 to 9% but here the peak infection rate went down from 15 to all the way only up to around 11% right so the lockdown is even though it is imposed across the economy it is not as effective for low skill workers compared to high skill workers and to add to the pain as you can see the inequality right the economic inequality is has also jumped up from around 2.6 which is the pre pandemic inequality to around 3.2 right so and of course the output needless to say of course if you are going to impose a lockdown the output has crashed from the deviation it has gone down to around output has crashed by around 75% right these are huge numbers so one of the important things that i want to convey through this slide is so the containment policies they are going to inflict a double pain right on low skill workers both on the economic front and on the health front right the economic front they are facing an increased income inequality because now they are getting uh, more affected compared to the high skill workers on the economic side on the labor income side why because now if you are going to uh, restrict labor mobility then of course the low skilled workers are going to get more affected by it. why because their nature of occupation is such that that they had to head out to work right so if you are going to say that the hawkers cannot or any uh, tea stall or any of these shops cannot open then their livelihood is cut right so because of that their income is going to get affected disproportionately compared to high skill worker like an accountant or any of those people right who can work from home maybe imperfectly but still they can work from home right so that is what is showing up in terms of increased inequality but what is happening here in terms of health inequality right what is happening in the sense even though the lockdown is suffered by both the lockdown is much more effective in reducing infections among high skilled workers compared to low skilled workers why because because the low skilled workers as i just told you they cannot work from home they optimally choose to venture out more 
compared to the high skilled workers right even though the cost of on site labor has gone up they still think it is worthwhile to venture out right because they have to earn their livelihood one way or the other this increases the risk of infections among the low skilled workers and so there is higher incidence of infections among them compared to the high skilled workers right so high skilled workers in a way on the economic side they are not as affected as the low skilled workers and also on the health side the containment policies is much more effective among high skilled workers compared to low skilled workers so that is why uh, the effect is on for a low skilled worker it's a double whammy on both economic front and on the health so this is just to put some numbers so the output loss under no policy this is for the period of lockdown so it's the output falls by around 5% but under sustained lockdown as i showed you in the figure it's crashes around 75% and on the staggered lockdown it's around 50% right but more importantly what we find is the inequality and under sustained lockdown jumps by around 21% and under staggered lockdown it jumps by around 8% right over the period of lockdown which is 300 days right? and what about the health side this is exactly what i showed you so if you see that the peak infection rate under no policy there is not much discrepancy between high skilled and low skilled workers but once you introduce a sustained lockdown the peak infection rate jumps i mean goes down from 15% to 9% for high skilled workers but it just goes down from 15 to 11% or 11.5% from low for low skilled right so the lockdown is not as effective among low skilled workers similarly if you want to look at days to double it's the same thing right so days to double has to increase because that what tells you that the infection is slowing down again the days to double has increased from 14 to around 21 days 14 and a half to 21 days for high skill but it has just increased from 14 and a half to 19 and a half days for low skill. so there is so this lockdown policies or the containment policies introduce a distortion between the uh, health experiences of the high skilled and the low skilled workers on top of the economic impact right? so this is one insight that comes out of our model and so just to uh, see what is how the how does our model explain what has happened over the period which we are interested in as you can see that so we are going to assume that the staggered lockdown is what the government implemented and the staggered lockdown is kind of resembles what happened in the uh, reality so assume then the economic impact between april and june so in data it has fallen by around 35% while the staggered lockdown our model predicts that output should have fallen I'm sorry. The inequality should have increased by 20%. Sorry, this is the inequality. Apologies. So, in the the inequality in the data has increased by around 35% in the April to June term uh, when uh, the lockdown was implemented, and our model predicts that just this channel alone, basically the imperfect substitutability between uh, on-site and remote labor, should lead to around 60% of this uh, increase in inequality. Right. And what is happening to the health impact side? so this is again coming from the data we do see that days to peak it took around 261 days to peak and our model kind of predicts even though it is not targeted to explain this our model predicts that uh, the model simulation shows that the days to peak is around 253 days under staggered lockdown right so if you assume that the no policy case where the government did nothing and the staggered policy is what the government actually implemented then the, you can argue that the staggered policy pushed the peak infection rate by around 30 days Right, from 221 to 253 days similarly it increased the days to double from 14.5 to 18 or 19 days right so in that way the lockdown the staggered lockdown is effective in pushing or at least delaying the peak by a month but the cost of it is super high in terms of economic impact right and also the distortion in the health impacts now finally coming to the transfers right so now i argue that the just implementing lockdown and the containment policy is going to lead to a huge increase in inequality now what we are asking is okay can we do something about it so what we have designed here is a very bare minimum response from the government that is suppose the government can uh, perform transfers right direct transfers to the low skilled workers alone right it's a targeted transfers for low skilled workers just to preserve the inequality right remember i am it is just to preserve the inequality what i mean by that if the high skilled workers if the high skilled workers income goes down by 20% then what is the transfer that is needed for the low skilled workers income also to go down by 20% right so the income is still going down but the magnitude of the decline is same now for both high skilled and low skilled workers right in the previous case the low skilled workers income went down by much more than high skilled workers that is why the inequality jumped up 
right so this we think is the bare minimum that the government can do just to preserve the inequality right not to preserve the income but just to preserve the inequality all right and so we solve this this is coming out of our model and if the government chooses a sustained containment this is how the transfers is going to look like and if it is a staggered containment this is the transfers that is what it's going to look like so once we introduce transfers what has happened right now again let us start from the inequality of course by design we have kept the inequality constant right the transfers are designed to do that so the green line is no policy the black line is just the containment and the magenta line or the pink line is containment and transfers right so by design the inequality is kept constant right now given that we have issued transfers just to keep the inequality constant what is happening on the health side actually the health or the containment policy the effectiveness of the containment policy increases once you introduce transfers into the model right what is happening here as you can see that first let's start with low skill because that's where the transfers are given as you can see that the low skill infections actually goes down right both in terms of so the peak gets delayed and the level the peak uh, the peak infection rate also goes down right from no policy it was around 15 16% it has gone down to around 9% right and interestingly the same thing happens for high skilled workers as well right the peak infection rate at, and the, the peak infection rate goes down here as well right so for the high skilled workers uh even though the the i'm sorry about that yeah. so even though the uh, the transfers are targeted towards the low skilled workers the peak infection rate and the uh, infections in general goes down for high skilled workers as well right so and more importantly from our inequality perspective the transfers actually reduces the health disparity between high skilled and low skilled workers right so now as you can see the peak infection rate between high skilled and low skilled workers are much closer they are around 9% or 8.5% once you introduce transfers for low skilled workers right and what is happening to the output loss actually interestingly the output loss didn't increase by much right so before going to that so why do you think the the transfers help reduce infections it's basically simple story is you are giving low skilled workers money so now they don't need to venture out to earn their living right so these transfers help them to stay at home and when they stay at home it is going to reduce the infections in their economy right so that is basically what so this is uh, this basically enables them to stay at home right so it's just giving them money to stay at home don't venture out right which they are more than happy to do because outside there is a risk of infection so the labor supply of low skill workers actually goes down that is what leads to a decline in infections but interestingly the output loss hasn't increased because of that right the output loss is still very similar to the containment case right why is that we will see in a bit right? so what is happening so this is how the labor behaves right for high skilled and low skilled workers so as you can see as when you give them transfers the low skilled on site labor actually goes down right so even without transfers the low skilled labor went down but with transfers it goes down by even more right and they do substitute a bit towards remote labor but remote labor is not productive at all so they are they just have transfer so they are more than happy to just stay at home and consume right but interestingly as you can see here what is happening with transfers for the high skill labor they actually do not cut down their labor as much as before right with transfers they do reduce their on site labor but not by as much in a pure containment case right so in the pure containment case it goes down at the peak to around 60% but here it just goes down by around 50% right so there is a positive externality that is happening here right you even though you give transfers to the low skilled workers what is happening is the low skilled workers are not venturing out because of that the total infections is going down in the economy and now the high skilled workers who are more productive they find it safer to venture out so they provide more on site labor right so basically the the less productive low skilled workers stays back while the more productive on site labor comes back relatively comes back to the market relative right and that is why the output loss is not much even though the low skilled workers labor goes down the output loss is still not higher because it is compensated by the more productive high skilled right so there is this nice positive externality that plays here right? so that is why we argue here that 
the transverse even though it acts as an economic policy because it preserves the inequality but more importantly it acts as a health policy purely coming from this figure right it helps in reducing the disparity in the health outcomes between high skilled and low skilled workers okay so and just to put some numbers here let's uh, panel a is something i have already shown you now we will just compare it with panel b so as i showed so the panel a is containment with no transverse panel b is containment with transverse so <clears throat> the output loss is very similar right or on similar lines even though the low skilled workers cut back on their labor supply now what is the amount of transverse that is needed here again these transverse are the bare minimum just to preserve the status quo on inequality not to control uh, the income right the income is still falling that is in a very small number right around 0.27% of gdp which is not much right so or 0.15% of gdp if we are taking the staggered number now what is happening on the health impact as you can see that with contain with transfers actually it behaves as a health policy that is we are doing the containment as before but we are just providing transfers it leads to a reduction in the peak infection rate and it leads to an increase in the days to double right so it happens for both right so even though you are giving transfers for just low skilled workers the peak infection rate and the days to double moves in a positive direction for both low skilled and high skilled workers and equally more importantly in my view at least the focus of the paper the disparity between the high skilled and low skilled infections has also gone down right now they are a bit more equal in the experience of the panel right so so that is why the the transfers the containment plus transfers they act as health policy in this case and that is pretty much what i wanted to say uh, i'm almost done with my time so just to conclude the containment policies at least from our model they impose a disproportionate economic cost on low skilled workers thus worsening inequality why purely because of the nature of occupation uh the low skilled workers they have to venture out for their work and that if you're going to impose a cost on labor mobility that is going to disproportionately affect them and the containment policies are also less effective in controlling infections among low skilled workers purely for the same reason because they optimally choose to venture out just to have their livelihood and risk, risking higher infections and in this case the direct transfers can actually improve the effectiveness of containment policies and basically it can reduce the total in peak infection and also reduce the discrepancy or the inequality between high skilled and low skilled workers okay. so that's pretty much what i wanted to say and thank you so much for your time seniors and thank you so much uh, this was excellent and we'd love to get shankar in to give his discussion uh, shankar over to you Shrinivasan, you may need to stop sharing your screen uh, for Shankar to be able to take over. Yeah. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. Um, Thank you, Koshik, for inviting me and uh, Srinivasan for uh, the most interesting uh, talk. Um, having worked in trying to understand the effects of infectious diseases in developing countries for a while, um, this was a pleasure to read. Um, and to cut to the chase, um, I found this to be an excellent paper. It's a great combination of an elegant model, um, clean calibration, um, which I particularly liked. It is very well written. Um, and I would, of course, argue that this is highly policy relevant. So let me paraphrase a little bit what the paper tries to do and then move on to giving you feedback about um, first the theory side of things and then the application of the policy uh, implementation of things. So the model rests on two related assumptions. And the first one is that people can choose whether to work on site or remotely. And the second assumption is that low skilled workers have less flexibility in working, in making that choice. So they are more locked into on site labor supply. It follows, therefore, that COVID shock, um, which leads to people um, scaling back their labor supply in response to the perceived higher risk from, uh, from you know, uh, engagement with the economy, um, has a higher cost on low skilled workers. And then containment policies amplify that cost because um, in response to containment um, and the loss of income, low skilled workers actually ramp up their supply of um, on-site labor, exposing themselves to higher risks. So relatively speaking, they are worse off both in economic and health terms. Now, 
once you think about the basic mechanics of the model, the results are not surprising. So the value of this framework lies more in the quantitative importance of these channels. And so what the authors produce, in my view, quite convincingly, is a framework to think about the Indian economy, a framework that reasonably well captures what happened last year. So for example, the containment policies can explain uh, through the lens of the model about 60% of the ob observed change in um, inequality between skilled and unskilled workers. So the value of the framework is in being able to capture the elements of the Ind Indian economy, and then more importantly, um, be a test case to think about alternative policies and experiments that can be used to inform and guide subsequent um, decisions. <laughs> Okay, so um, as I said, I'm going to divide up my comments on um, theory contributions or um, things that can be done to improve the theory as well as um, on the policy side. So let me start with the theoretical uh, side of things. There is actually a pretty large literature on what I call economic epidemiological models. So the SIR model, of course, is something that is popular from epidemiology. And the basic idea there is that people are switching across three categories, susceptible, infectious, and infective, and, um, and recovered. There's, of course, also the absorbing state of death. Um, and um, in those models, the transmission, the transition from each of these things are partly endogenous to the proportion of um, populations in each of these groups. But then the actual flow rates are driven by, um, I would say, model parameters, some to do with the economy, some to do with uh, the biology of the disease. But these are taken to be exogenous. And a crucial element of these models is what's called the basic rate of reproduction, the BRR, um, oftentimes abbreviated as R0, which captures whether or not the disease is going to spread over time. So if R0 is bigger than one, what it means is that one infective person can transmit the infection to more than one person. Therefore, the disease will spread. If that is the case, then in those class of SIR models, um, there is going to be a steady state where the disease is endemic. That is, some proportion of the population will always have the disease. If on the other hand, R0 is less than one, then over time, the disease will disappear. It will dissipate. Now, you can now see that in those class of models, how policy might be used to control the disease by switching from R0 bigger than one to R0 less than one. So what this class of economic epidemiologic models do is to throw in human behavior into all of this, which makes the transmission rate from infectious to susceptible individuals endogenous to choices. And that produces um, also an effective um, basal, basic rate of reproduction. Um, I'm going to call it R0 tilde to imply that it's different from the biological R0. Um, and it is endogenous. And it's endogenous to human behavior. It's also endogenous to policies. And the power of economics comes from trying to think about how people respond to this threat of the disease and to alternative policies that are put in place. So um, the first place I would say that authors should actually cite a bunch of this literature, and there's a large literature, and much of it is theoretical. So the macro literature is relatively new, um, but I think it's important to kind of understand what has come before. I'm going to also use this point to kind of emphasize that certain assumptions of the model are not as obvious to me. So for example, in the standard SIR model, um, if the, you've got S number of people who are susceptible and I number of people who are infectious and the transmission rate from an infectious person to a susceptible person is beta, then the number of susceptible people who get infected is beta times S times I. Now beta here is a model parameter. In this model, um, the authors have a richer structure, and they're borrowing this from the Eichenbaum um, et al. paper. So the richer structure says that transmission can happen from one of three channels, from consumption-based interactions, going out shopping, let's say, from work-based interactions, from commuting to work or working with other um, you know, colleagues, and from social interactions. And the SIR model specification is, according to these authors, would be closest in spirit to their social interactions, okay? Now, the first thing that I would like to know, because this is a new structure, is what does this new structure buy them in terms of model dynamics that they could not produce using the standard SIR model? Now, the standard SIR model doesn't have human behavior, but it's kind of useful to understand what the model gains relative to that non-behavioral model. 
You could also model other kinds of human behaviors. So for example, what the authors do not have in this model is people choosing to wear masks or choosing to isolate themselves voluntarily without a government mandate or practicing social um, safe distancing. None of those happen. And those things through beta could also affect susceptible to infections. So some discussion about why these choices were not made would be helpful. So the next thing I argued is the value of this model is in trying to use this as an experiment for policies in the context of India. So what makes this a good model for India? Um, some of it is to do with how the model is calibrated to Indian particularities, but some of it I would think, um, and I th assume that's the, the way the authors are thinking of this, is that emphasis on skilled versus unskilled workers and inequality between them. Now, that is not particular to India. So what is particular to India is there are a lot more unskilled workers, for example, relative to skilled workers than in many advanced economies, and that is what makes it similar to other developing countries. But there are also other differences, and the authors do not explore those differences, which I think can be potentially interesting channels to think about, perhaps not in this um, work, but in subsequent work. One is that you know, more than 80% of the non-agricultural workers in India are employed in informal sectors. And informality, I think, plays an important role. One role is that there may be more fungibility, more flexibility in shifting from um, different occupations, shifting between different occupations and shifting from on-site to remote work for certain kinds of informal works that is not captured in the model. Um, I will argue that this is also relevant for um, one of the policy experiments that do. The other interesting feature of the Indian economy is that compared to the level of um, economic development that India is at, services account for a larger share of value added, like more than 50%, and about 30% of the workforce is employed in services. And services are where there's a lot more flexibility that is available. And to some extent that is captured by the skilled workers, but services in India is not just skill-based. Um, there are also a lot of low-skilled um, um, jobs out there. And the third element, which ex ante I would not have thought would be an important margin to think about, but of course, given what happened last year, we know is an important margin, is that being a large economy where uh, economic opportunities are, are spatially um, dispersed, there is a large set of migrant workers, and these migrant workers can, in principle, be conduits of spreading infection. And policy can actually affect the spread of infection through this channel in, uh, in interesting ways um, that we saw last year. The last set of comments about the theory, um, I would like to know more about the model properties. So in the standard SIR model, when there is an endemic steady state, convergence to the steady state is non-monotonic. There is like oscillatory convergence. And that is interesting because what it implies is that um, the disease goes in cycles. Um, the cycles get less and less common um, as the economy converges to an endemic steady state, but there are cycles nonetheless. In other words, we should expect this waves of infection that we seem to be seeing in the world. In this model with behavior thrown in, I'm pretty sure that is also happening and the authors don't talk about it. So I would like to know a little bit more about this. Um, I would also like to know what the evolution of the endogenous or not is um, in terms of the model, um, the reduced form version of that. Um, it's a complicated thing, but the authors do actually have a nice way of doing that through this parameter chi, which is uh, uh, you know, amalgamation of lots of uh, underlying structural parameters. Um, a little bit of work of the model is that people are dying from these infections and there are no births. So asymptotically, the population, population is shrinking, and I'm not quite sure how to think about an economy where asymptotically the population is going to zero, right? So uh, I think all these classes of models have that feature, so it's not unique to this paper, but you know, it's something to be aware of. A few minor comments, minor in the context because you are doing computational work, so this is less essential. Uh, you've got... Um, you are implicitly normalizing utility from death to zero. Not, that's not stated, it should be. In principle, that can create problems because you have log utilities. So if consumption levels are less than one, then utility from death can exceed um, utility from being alive. And because probabilities across these different states are endogenous, that can create all sorts of you know, strange um, choice um, uh, choices. So um, I don't think you run into this problem because you've calibrated the level of income sufficiently high that consumption, I'm pretty sure, is bounded sufficiently about one. But nonetheless, you should address that. Um, also, because probabilities are endogenous, expected utility can be non-concave. 
Um, and there are some theoretical works. So you, are welcome, you, know, you should check out the Journal of Mathematical Economics had a special issue recently on COVID, um, which is largely theoretical. And a bunch of these papers talk about the SIR model in economic context through different kinds of behavioral responses. And some of them do um, grapple with this, um, with this, um, the, the sufficiency of the first order conditions. Okay. Um, you're also assuming that people do not get reinfected once they recover from infection, make that explicit. Um, and that might be another channel worth exploring if, um, if the data is to be believed there is some proportion of individuals who are getting reinfected, and it might not be a bad thing to think about down the road, especially um, if there are new mutations that make um, vaccines less effective and produce uh, reinfections down the road. Um, let me move on to the application of the model. And here, um, I've got two groups of comments. First, it's to do with exactly what you do, and secondly, to do with what you could do um, down the road. I was unclear about how the pi d, the probability of death from infection, was calibrated. The most obvious way seems to be to calibrate it to the case fatality rates, and maybe that data is not available, but some discussion of that would have been helpful. Also, when that parameter chi or um, the ag average number of R0 um, in the model is calibrated, um, you are picking R0 uh, values from, um, from studies that were done last year. I believe there are now studies specific to the Indian context, so it might be useful to um, pick your values from um, India. And just because I think um, R0 has been known to differ across countries um, for reasons that I think people are still debating. It would be nice to have um, the model a little bit closer to the Indian um, data. I have no comments in terms of the actual policies that were studied in the paper. They are fairly transparent. They seem to do a good job of capturing what was actually adopted. One thing that you could want to think about is kinds of lockdown policies that have been done in other countries. For example, Italy was a country that in the initial stages of the epidemic decided to calibrate its lockdown strategies to threshold values of R0. So basically, if infection rates exceed a certain threshold, they're going to impose severe lockdowns and they're going to last for a while. So in terms of the model, whenever R0 is bigger than one, the infection is spreading. Whenever R0 is less than one, infections are shrinking. So therefore, it is sufficient to push down R0 just below one. Now, of course, if you push it further below one, that's more effective at reducing infections and deaths, but it comes at an economic cost. So there's a trade-off there that is worth exploring. And in particular, um, a threshold-based model might actually be also useful in reducing uncertainty in the minds of the population so people can plan ahead. And the cost may actually be smaller than what was actually practiced from that margin. The other thing that's worth thinking about, and here the Journal of Mathematical Economics um, special issue might be actually helpful, is to think about what the optimal policy should have been in the Indian context. There are studies about optimal policy in a theoretical context, but it would be interesting in my view to understand Given the Indian particularities, what could the government have done better? Now, this would require you to think about a planner or the government um, having an objective function. And a simple one would be to have a trade-off between preventing infections or deaths and preventing output loss. Um, a good starting point is a recent paper by Hall, G Jones, and Kleiner on this. Um, and you already implicitly are doing this trade-off because you're talking about health outcomes in terms of preventing infections, and you are um, comparing that to output loss under different policies. But having that explicit social welfare function might help you understand also what the optimal intensity and duration of the lockdown would have been. The transfers make total sense. It's good to see that the cost of the transfers are not big. I would worry about implementability because in the Indian context where a lot of people are not in the formal market economy, giving these transfers might be a totally different ballgame. It might be politically and uh, in practice, uh, policy-wise, infeasible. So some discussion of that would have been helpful. All right, so I mentioned migrant workers before, um, and I think here is an interesting thing to think about down the road. One of the reasons I suggested spending a little time talking about the model's dynamics is that I can see how the model matches reasonably well time to peak infections and doubling time. 
But I have a hunch the model is actually not doing a great job matching the actual trajectory to that peak. So here is the way I would think about in a particular context. So um, what we saw last year was that the lockdown imposed especially high cost on a subgroup of the workers, the migrant workers, and in particular, the March lockdown, um, which was imposed at short notice, um, left them stranded. And they were scampering to go get back home. Many of them um, you know, died, many of them suffered immensely. But the other thing that happened is because as they made their way back to their hometowns and home villages, the disease spread uh, along the way and um, in their home communities. So what that means is that the lockdown in the model um, has an immediate effect on slowing the spread of the disease. But in practice, in the Indian context, that didn't quite happen. Um, I would be interested to see to what extent empirically that was true. And secondly, whether the mod model could actually explain that. And here, I think the model's rigid transmission mechanism can be actually used to um, shed some light. So um, a simple way to think about this is suppose cap a fraction of the unskilled workers or migrant workers. And normally a lockdown would disrupt their uh, market labor supply. So you've got the new parameter that reduces the effectiveness of the labor supply. But imagine that mu of labor supply that's lost is now time diverted to social interactions because people are spending more time with their family or spending time going back home. And, and you can calibrate that, that, that magnitude to how long it took for, this, uh, for, for these workers to return back home. And I think the model is going to predict, therefore, that a lockdown has an immediate increase in the transmission of the disease that then goes down. And it would be therefore interesting to think about these channels as well as think about what the model can explain in terms of the dynamics um, that, um, that are closer to the data beyond the measures that you look at. You've got a fantastic income-based data um, that you're using um, to measure how much inequality went up. Um, your COVID data is less fantastic for various reasons. In fact, I'm seeing some estimates that say that COVID um, case and death rates may be underestimated by as much as two to 30 times, right? So there's huge variance on what people think um, has been going on in India. And this is an age old problem. I mean, some estimates also say, for example, the Spanish flu um, killed three times as many people um, as were reported in, in, in the data a century ago. So it would be kind of nice to think about robustness checks about, well, what if the COVID data is much higher than what you see? Now, on the one hand, what that would mean is that if you were to increase the COVID incidence rates in terms of the model, um, the model would fall much shorter. On the other hand, of course, that would affect how you calibrate the model. And so it's unclear to me how that robustness check will pan out. But I think it's important to talk about that because um, you are trying to make this a policy-based paper and trying to say that the model can explain uh, the observed changes in income inequality, which is more precisely measured. Um, you started writing the paper last year, a very topical paper, um, but I think at this point, the discussion has moved in a different direction. One of them is about vaccine efficacy. And that might be um, easy to introduce into the model. In particular, you can think about the efficacy of current vaccines, but also efficacy of vaccines relative to uh, new mutations that might um, then need to be addressed through further lockdown or other kind of containment policies. And the model, I think, is also an interesting one to think in terms of, well, given current vaccine efficacy rates and assuming that there are no uh, potent mutations that happen, what is the percent of the population that has to be vaccinated to give herd immunity? Um, I haven't seen a lot of studies in the Indian context. I think here economists have a bit of a um, something to say about these cases because behavior plays such an important part of, um, of, of the transmission of the disease. And it would be good to use this kind of model to shed light on, um, on herd immunity-based policies. On the whole, this was a fantastic read. I really enjoyed it. As I said, it is a well-written, well-done paper and um, highly pulse relevant. So thank you again. Thank you, Shankar, uh, for really excellent comments. Srinivasan, with your permission, may I quickly bring in uh, the one or two questions that the audience have thrown up uh, as well as a few thoughts from us and then hand it back over to you and to Shankar to wrap up this discussion. Sure, sure, please, yeah. Excellent. Uh, there, the questions that have come in from the audience, um, I'll try to fit them in uh, into uh, Shankar's discussion and the, the little bit that 
we can also add from our side at CMI. Uh, I would say broadly, Shankar, and uh, it sounds like there are three sets of comments. One is ways in which the model can be made richer uh, through the introduction of you know maybe more components into the function itself, uh, and then comments on the appropriate let's say calibration of parameters, both the economic parameters as well as the medical parameters. Uh, on all three of them, uh, one in terms of making the model richer, in terms of uh, worker formality, uh, there's actually a lot that CPHS, the data set itself has to offer because we do know uh, the kinds of jobs people have, whether they're salary jobs, whether they're temporary, whether they're self-employed, et cetera. So it could be potentially something that uh, can be done to enrich the model. In terms of the kind of work that they're doing, whether they're doing services related work, et cetera, uh, that's also there in the data in terms of the industry of occupation, et cetera. So potentially that could be brought into the model. Uh, Shankar's point on migration, I think is uh, so interesting as well. Uh, Srinivasan, you may not uh, have seen this yet, but since September, 2019, CPHS has collected very, very rich data now on both in migration as well as out migration. Uh, even before that, we've been collecting a fair amount of data on out-migration through households. So potentially there's some way to bring that in, uh, in terms of model calibration and parameter calibration there. Uh, then broadly, just a few more points in terms of economic parameters as well as medical parameters. And these are bringing in some of the questions from the audience too. Um, I think the big question from the audience is, how would you classify somebody that doesn't have a college degree, but is working say as a tune in a government office? Uh, where the skill, the way in which you are classifying people uh, may be you know, slightly different. Uh, that's, it's an open question and it's completely up to you as authors on how you choose to decide whether someone is high skilled or low skilled. To the extent that it's useful, uh, we also have a, um, a variable called nature of occupation, which includes among other categories, whether you're a blue collar worker, a white collar worker, an industrial worker, an agricultural worker, et cetera. So there may be uh, a, a definition of skills that you could use that could try and accommodate those things. Uh, finally, and this is my last point, and then back to you, Srinivasan and, and, and Shankar to wrap up the discussion. Uh, this point about what the true rate of mortality is, we're all grappling with it. Nobody has an answer because we don't really have um, good administrative data on the subject. CPHS was never designed to be a survey that collects information on vital statistics, but when we update the member roster, we include information on whether anybody has passed away from the household. So we know that there are other researchers that are looking into this data and trying to use the death data that comes out as a consequence of updating the member roster in CPHS, taking advantage of the panel nature of the, of the survey to try and compute their measures of excess deaths. And that might be another interesting avenue to calibrate one of the parameters that might really you know, change the results and things like that. So I'll pause here. Uh, Mahesh, if you had any other points that you wanted to, to bring in, uh, feel free. And then I'm handing it over back to Srinivasan and Shankar. Uh, no, I think uh, this has been an excellent presentation and a superb uh, set of comments by Shankar. Really enjoyed it. Uh, we'd like to pass it back to the author and the commentator to wrap this up. This has been really superb. Fantastic work based on the data and fantastic comments. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shankar. Uh, yeah, these are great comments. Uh, I mean, uh, we have thought a bit about these things, but yeah, these these kind of put us give us some clarity on pretty much uh, everywhere in the paper. Uh, one thing that stood out was yes, the migrant workers thing. The the way you asked her, or you suggested the modeling that that's very nice, uh, very neat. Um, maybe we will uh, definitely uh, think and explore it further. Um, and regarding the. Um, and the optimal policy again. So uh, that was, uh, at least when we started, that was what we thought of what wanted to do, but we kind of took this as a stopgap thing, but we maybe we should revisit that. Uh, but yeah, the Hall, Jones and Clino, yes, I have uh, had a look at, look at that paper before, but I should relook at it. And uh, yes, I think that is an important uh, uh, question in the Indian context, uh, definitely in terms of uh, behavioral uh, things and uh, in terms of Indian calibration and what the government could have done better, yes, uh, definitely an important question. And I believe, yeah, hopefully we can work on that. And uh, and one more thing which I wanted to, so yeah, the citing better, yes, uh, definitely yes. So we, we didn't do a good job of that. I will definitely applaud that. And uh, regarding the, uh, so regarding the standard SAR versus our model, uh, 
what we gain out of that maybe so one thing that pops out of it, like maybe i'm wrong maybe please feel free to correct me so if i'm going to talk about just the uh, on site labor influencing the infection uh, the disease dynamics uh, so i needed some the labor component entering that equation so that was my idea so with a when we just talk about beta times s uh, times i so there was no concept of uh, how there was no uh, direct way of introducing an on site labor into the disease dynamics so that's why we took this route but uh, maybe we should explore a bit more about what the literature has done in that area so um, and uh, regarding that yes the evolution of arnot yes we we can definitely tease that out of the model that would be nice to look at and a link to that so we can also once we tease out arna then arna tilde then we can also experiment with italy style uh, kind of lockdown policy maybe that uh, that's a very interesting idea um but yeah so we don't know how much we can fit into this paper but these are all some uh, really good comments that uh, for the future that uh, there are number of things that we can pick out of this uh, and uh, uh, yeah thank you so much for this i mean uh, we need still need to process a lot of these things but uh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and these are incredible comments uh, thank you yeah. well you welcome i mean you did the hard work and my job was much easier <laughs> so so thank you for uh, for an excellent paper um not everything can be done in one paper and i'm also not suggesting that you make substantial changes to what you have right now so think of these comments as kind of mostly to help frame your further research but also um in terms of identifying um you know what other kind of data you could bring to bear and i'm really excited to hear that cphs data has is going to actually cover migrants as well as um informality because you could potentially also look at the longer term consequences of this epidemic in terms of if some workers were pushed towards more informal occupations as a result of this pandemic and these lockdown policies to what extent were those uh, were those uh, choices uh, persistent um, how quickly do they go back to the formal economy uh, as you know india has a huge formal sector uh, informal sector and therefore um, and it, it's kind of been a bit of a um, interesting uh, topic in itself trying to understand what the sources of informality are and anything we can do to kind of poke holes and trying to figure out how policy can make a dent to that um, um, would be um, uh, useful but um, this was you know this was an excellent opportunity thank you for that and thank you koshik and mahesh um, for this chance shankar shrinivas and it's been our absolute pleasure thank you both so much for making the time uh shrinivasan again uh, it's a great, like mahesh said a great paper we all benefited so much from the discussion uh, both of the paper as well as the comments that shankar had uh, thank you very much uh, it's 9 pm uh, india time so i'll go ahead and close the session unless yeah. you have any final remarks that you'd like to make uh, nothing thank you so much thank you so much kaushik mahesh and shankar uh, very fruitful session and i benefited uh, benefited a lot out of it yeah thank you and enjoyed it as well yeah thanks so much Wonderful. Thank you so much, and thanks to the audience for sticking around till the end. We'll see you all again soon. Thank you.